and welcome to this very special edition of the Irish Wrestling Podcast. My name is Mark O'Brien. I'm joined today by the one and the only, the master of the half crab, the OJMO, Michael Oku. Michael, thank you very much for joining this evening. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing really, really well. I'm very excited to be to, on your channel. Do you, you do a lot of really cool interviews that I've like peaked and seen? So awesome to be a part of it, man. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool for me more than anything. Listen, I, I, I've been a, a long time fan, particularly of independent wrestling. It's kind of this part of the world for a long time. And um, between you coming over here to OTT shows, me traveling to Red Pro shows, back in the day, progress all around the scene as well. Um, you're it, a lot of fans from around the world. I see you know I've got an audience within Body Slam. Um, they would primarily see you kind of on your recent success, be it with CMLL or New Japan. They might see you as an overnight success, but those of us in this part of the world know you've been scratching and clawing for many, many years. You've become Right, Cabaret champion, you're a Red Pro Grand Slam champion, you've had a huge amount of success. For those in America, maybe, would you be able to give us a fill in on just slightly a bit more around your own background and kind of how you got into the business? Well, well, it's interesting because I feel like I'm like, if you use the term overnight success and I mean not being there, it feels like mm-hmm. I've had like a lot of overnight successes mm-hmm. throughout my career, like faster than normal. I mean, so I started in 2017 and that was in the midst of the boom of British wrestling and everything in, in all of Europe, European wrestling. Yeah. Um, I really got into that. That's just kind of when I decided I'm going to be a wrestler, but not even because of a boom. I didn't realize there was a boom. It just lined up in terms of where my life was. I was like, yeah. you know, what? I've always dreamed of being a wrestler. Let me at least try it. Learned about the progress wrestling school. And by that, I learned more about the British wrestling scene and that there were shows happening up and down the country multiple times a week. I was like, oh my God, what's going on? And actually, the week after I started wrestling training is when the WWE UK tournament started, which was a, a wild thing, just an unprecedented thing that was happening that felt like it came out of nowhere. So I was like, oh, A, I've come to the right place, and B, I think I've started at the right time. So uh, to, to get that start, and then in six months to have my wrestling debut for Progress Wrestling, that was uh, felt like an overnight thing yeah. in terms of that being the case and then things from there just kept going and going like faster than most people would 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 imagine it's definitely me for sure no listen and yet again you, you kind of touched on there like a lot of times i myself included when you discover independent wrestling it's like going down a rabbit hole and you're just sort of like okay there's more than just two or three companies around the world more than just japan or mexico domestically close to where we have we got some excellent unbelievable performers and you, you've been leading the charge for the last while like particularly with your, your work for it in rev pro like i said at the start you're a grand slam champion the longest reigning cruiserweight champion you're a tight team champion the current undisputed british heavyweight champion what is your success within rev pro in particular and kind of being given the baton as being the guy in british wrestling now what does that mean to you personally oh it, it means so much and, and especially in the fact that it felt like I was just given the opportunity to be that person, if that makes sense, or multiple opportunities on the way. Like really what it felt like with my RevPro journey was, I mean, my very first match was after loads of crewing and and Andy just asked if I can be a body to, for the RevPro TV show tapings. I need someone to be essentially, no, literally squashed by the great Okan. Um, And I had a less than two minute match with the great Okan and did the most with that opportunity and did the best job I could at getting beaten up in less than two minutes for me to get more opportunities. And, and I always felt like with RevPro, I was rewarded for doing a 10 out of 10 job of whatever my job was on that day. And it, it, it with that came bigger opponents. I was given more time to have more competitive matches. And then that's where I got the the big opportunities with Sugar Hero Irie mm. and then I'm in the ring next day I know it with with Pac and then yeah. that match you know at, at the time I would say that's the match that really put me on the map at least in British wrestling and then it got some people making some murmurs around the world so I really feel like RevPro was the best company for me at giving me those opportunities and essentially rewarding me for those opportunities I think that's where the reason that I am where I am today with them yeah, and that must give you a huge amount of confidence more than anything. Like you're into your journey two to three years, and then you're facing Pac. You're just coming off WWE TV. Like, what was that meant for you personally? Like, I, I don't imagine my issues. Like, if I was thrown into the deep end, suddenly somebody straight off WWE TV. Not only that, but Pac as well. One of his British return matches. I'm being thrust into the spotlight, thrust into this position. I'd be shitting my pants. But like, you, you have, you, you took it in your stride. You absolutely smashed it. And you say you kind of gained a name for yourself. What was that like for you on a personal level going into? And what was the satisfaction like afterwards? 
Yeah, it was crazy. Two, so that was two years into my my wrestling yeah. career. Like two two years to the month of my first match was when I wrestled him. Um, I was always a fan of Pac, primarily because he was from Newcastle and I supported Newcastle United. So I was like, while I was watching him on WWE TV, even before Wade got signed, I was like, this, you would see the moves he does. And you're like, this yeah. man is incredible. And then when you find success, there was that. It felt like I was part of the success and I was really rooting for him. And I, I'd go to WWE live shows and, you know, it would be like Raws and Smackdowns at the O2 Arena in London. And they might put an NXT match on and it would be him versus Sami Zayn in like the dark match. And not any, but nobody really knew, you know, the, the, back, especially back in those days, it wasn't like NXT wasn't like as widely hardcore. Like it didn't have that wide fan base as it does now, where I feel like if Trick Williams came out to SmackDown, people would know who he is. But back then, when Sami Zayn and Pac and Adrian Neville at the time mm-hmm. came up, nobody really knew who they were, but he'd always leave impressing them with when he did his red arrow. So I was always a huge fan. So then to be one of the people that is wrestling him on fresh off his return, he had not only fresh off the return, but he had just freshly wrestled Will Ospreay, yeah. York Paul. Mm-hmm. The, the pressure was there. It was, it was usually there, but I just had to stick to what I believed my strengths were. And that was to, to sell and to be a baby face in peril. And I, and I felt that if I stuck with that, then that would lead us to having a, a really good match. And I didn't know that, the match we'd have would be one that people would remember for a long time because again of how how long the match went it went and then it went to a time of draw people were begging and cheering hoping for a draw which is something you rarely see in pro wrestling um but but that's what happened and i really felt like we caught magic in a bottle that day and that really helped propel me i think to many different opportunities just later in, in that year of 2019 yeah, it was absolutely incredible. And you said talk about the trust Andy put in you, like you would very much reward that trust. Like in terms of later on, then you're I remember last year I was over for the eleventh anniversary show. And it, you see your transport transformation over the past number of years, going from an independent wrestler showing up to shows for OTT, be in Belfast or Wolverhampton, interacting with you there, to then coming out of these eleven anniversary show, the cover box, the big arena. You're the you're the headway champion or going to be the headway champion or rep pro at that show. The marquee match. I know Will's on later on, but that for those who are following Rep Pro on a weekly basis. That match with you and Trent Seven was what was following. A lot of the fans were there to see as well. And you were drawing a huge amount of that audience. Um, what was that occasion like for you? Obviously, all in weekends going on at the same time. But like drawing that audience, huge crowd, marquee event, 11th anniversary. What was that weekend as a whole like for you? It was such a huge achievement. Again, being part of the company in such a, a strong way. It was, I was able to really reflect about the pandemic, 2020. And how we were doing as RevPro, we were doing empty arena shows, literally in front of no one. Yeah. Putting on Fight TV, sometimes trying to stream it through Twitch and and, and anywhere. We we're just trying to put wrestling out there for people to watch. Yeah. And and I'm just hoping for the best that people would like what we're putting out. And the thick the thing that gets me emotional is, is about my my music. Is in that's the first time I used the current music that I use. Mm-hmm. And First time I heard that music and walked out with that music, it, they, I was walking out in front of no one. And I remember my thought when it played in the Copper Box Arena. It's like, wow, the first time I heard this song, I was walking out through a curtain and nobody was there. And now I'm walking out and over 4,000 people are here. Mm-hmm. So I really felt it as just a, a huge victory for myself and for, for Rev Pro for, for kind of like staying the course and presenting people with the best wrestling that they can. And you showed them something completely different that night as well. Like against Trent, it was almost like a car crash at different points. Like it was something like you had to see like you as a young champion. Can you move away from technical matches? Can you move away from what you're used to, you're good at? Can you go through these wars where you're suddenly being thrown through tables and doing X, Y, Z? What was that like as a challenge to you as much as anything? Showing that you have that fire, showing that you can overcome somebody who's willing to throw all these additional factors at you in an environment like that. Well, I was something well. Being trying to be a diverse wrestler or present yeah. myself as a diverse wrestler is mm-hmm. a goal I've had since starting wrestling. In fact, there was a a year when the year of 2018 started, I had like a good line of bookings sorted out. And it was such it was against such an array of wrestlers. I was in tag matches, uh, comedy matches. I was like one week gonna be booked against Chris Ridgway, the next week gonna be booked to wrestle Tony Storm. Like there was so much stuff in the pipeline now, and I was proud of that because of the diversity that it could show, hey, everybody, put me against literally everyone and I will make it work. So to have that situation at the Copper Box, where again, I believe it was, I mean, at least 10 matches on the card, great running through, 
you know, we were both thinking of making sure that we stood out on the card and we thought there was no better way to do that by adding the drama. And, you know, Trent had Levi Muir ringside. Of course, I had a mirror at ringside. And why not use tables, ref bumps? Let's just go for it. Let's just go for a car crash and give present the people who are at that show something different. Uh So, yeah, I was really, really happy with the fact that I was able to show people that I can go through that same thing as well as just go from a bell to bell match. Yeah, like it launched you into like a, was it your past incredible year since then? Like obviously, as somebody watches Red Pro religiously, both in person and on demand, you get to see the likes yourself with Ed Sero, Gabe Kidd, Luke Jacobs, Zach Gibson. But obviously, what a lot of people um have talked about the last year or so, particularly over the last couple of days with his documentary coming out, it was your match with Will Osprey, and it was really really cool again to see your your reflections and hindsight from that match as well as part of the documentary series. Obviously, there's like it, Crystal Palace Arena doesn't quite give off the same vibe on camera as it does in person i was there at royal quest 2 uh where you made your new japan debut and it's one of the best arenas i've ever been in my life for a noise and a volume um so what was that like for you in person what was it like the crowd atmosphere building it all up and then later to see the, the critical acclaim it got oh it's truly incredible the, the, yeah. the atmosphere in that venue if, if they if the crowd are up for a match up for a show yeah. You really, really feel it because again, you pick pack two thousand people in there, and I think as we got close to it, it was two thousand people, and and we felt all of that, and I heard all of that. Um, that that match was, it was so weird because although I felt like I gave my best performance, I yeah. felt the most nervous than I have for a very, very long time for many reasons. Of course, the the weight of expectation, the fact that it's a rematch of a really highly critically acclaimed match we've yeah. already had, the fact that. Tony Khan is there watching and the fact that it's Will's last match and peep, so many more people will be watching, not just in person, but, you know, online and be, be checking it. So, but the noise, the noise, I like that. That's all wrestlers are dying for noise when it comes yeah. to fans. And th- it was one of the loudest noises I've heard multiple times within the match. And then that there are some, yeah, that like, even if you watch it back, I've, I've heard people who've watched it only on the VOD. Yeah, he yeah. says, man, it sounds crazy. Mm-hmm. And he, I'm telling them, I'm telling you, it doesn't yeah. even do it justice of yeah. how loud it was in person. I, I had the same reaction when at that World Quest 2, when you made your debut, like that main event was Aussie Open FTR and people were on their feet for half an hour straight. I'd never experienced that. Like I've got a rugby background and I've never been to a match or anything like that. And there's something about the people that attend Rev Pro in that venue, that crowd, wherever the noise comes reverberating back around, like I'm watching on demand your match and then you're seeing on Twitter and people are losing their minds, but it's it's not quite the same. But I know that purely based on experience, but like just touching on kind of your experience in Crystal Palace, obviously. Um, how cool has it been? Because I, I was just re- reflecting on this recently. Royal Quest 2, you make your debut. You kind of appear both both shows. It's cool. It's kind of, it's a nice gesture in terms of your team with RKJ one night. The next night you're losing to like Desperado and Dookie. But then the next night, the next year, your team with Tanahashi. Your team with Eddie Kingston and you're put as like this premier. I'm representing British wrestling. You're no longer one of the young guys coming in just as kind of a almost a token gesture of kind of a number of British young talents are appearing. You're the guy. Like, what was that like for you personally? I, again, as a sense of satisfaction. Like, I've I've overcome X Y Z. One year down the line, I'm now the guy in this space. Uh, yeah, again, that's it's such an amazing yeah. feeling to like. I, I do my best to really try and reflect and to look back and like think about how my journey. Yeah. And yeah, to to think that I would be teaming alongside Eddie Kingston and Tanahashi. Eddie Kingston is someone I've had like loads of respect for, and I'm a bit been a big fan of, especially when he was doing so many indies in in Europe and you know like pre pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And Tanahashi is someone I've literally modeled myself after. One of the very few wrestlers I've actually tried to study and emulate as best I can. He's the ace. So yeah, yeah. and it, it's crazy that people within Rev Pro were calling me the ace of Rev Pro before we even st- we had that tag match. So it was a very uh, a wonderful feeling to then be the one that, again, like I said, I'm teaming up with them. Uh, I'm getting the pinfall with them. The music's played. There, there is one thing about that, actually, that I don't think I've actually, that's been revealed. There are some people I have seen that weren't a fan of the match because they came out to my music. Okay. If, if you watch the entrance... It's only one song that plays, yeah. and then you know Tanashi comes up. But if you, if I implore everyone to rewatch that entrance, because if you see, I walk out first, and then I hear a nice, respectable reaction for me. Then I hear a louder reaction for me. I'm like, oh, I guess they're just 
could see me clearly now and then they're really happy to see me and I turn around and see Tanashi and Eddie Kingston behind me like oh that's who they're cheering for yeah the the reason being they weren't supposed to come out to my entrance music <laughs> oh really okay they were indeed supposed to have separate musics where everybody could hear yeah. their music their, their signature songs and come out to it separately but at the New Japan traditionally with New Japan most entrances in tag matches mm. it is just like one song and they come out yeah. so they must have just assumed well i guess this is the song we're coming or, out to or they're doing something really nice for you and putting you over in your front of your hometown crowd this is our guy like that could be a, that would be really really cool I, I that's, what people, okay, 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 that's what people enough. thought okay 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 that's what people thought i know for a fact i i know for a fact because it was on a sheet <laughs> <laughs> coming out separately <laughs> so uh yeah for that to yeah for that to happen i was like oh boy okay oh, well, boy. listen that that's that's that, listen take it regardless they came into your i'll take it yeah 100 will take it like yeah being part of red pro in new japan you, obviously i think red pro get the, the flares they get like you're all part of this kind of i suppose they're turning in a wrestle dynasty um you've obviously appeared uh, briefly at AEW all in you've appeared in new japan You've appeared, um, you've obviously the, the Grand Slam champion, the Rev Pro. You also got to appear at the Jericho Cruise and PWG and Bola. Obviously, there's connections with the likes of Excalibur and Chris Jericho there. How did those two come about? What, from from Bola? Uh, well, I guess Bola led to the Jericho Cruise. Yeah. Uh, no, no, Jericho so... appeared in the same Bola show, I think, at the same time when you appeared there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you asking how the, the Jericho match sure, came yeah. about? That whole kind of, that, sorry, from Bola to then to the Jericho Cruise, it just seemed like, wow, okay. Some, one of our guys being flown over to Bola, which is one of the coolest things in the world. And obviously you smash it there. Then Jericho obviously takes a liking to you. Then, then you're on the cruise and now you're the champion of all the oceans. So like, it's a, <laughs> listen, feather in your cap. Like, how did that whole thing come about? You obviously, yeah. I mean, that's one of those things where I don't even know the full, the full answer, right. but as in it, it happened nearly as you described it. So with PWG, uh, you know, I, I got an email. It's so funny how it works sometimes, you know. Yeah. You just get an email asked to be part of Battle of Los Angeles. Um, that would have been obviously the, coming to the end of 2022 yeah. that I got that email. Uh, I want to believe that it was probably the Osprey match from yeah. York Hall that probably really helped that 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 come along. Yeah. Um, and then they announced it. It, it was it was actually it was very funny the way it happened on Twitter because there was like a random twitter account that just decided to repost the highlights of the match from me and will from new york call which is in january they just decided to repost it again in like november being like hey guys do you remember this cool match crazy match and it was getting all these likes and all this interaction and then the next day is when i get announced for bola awesome so it's almost like the world got excited about this me yeah. and this match and then hello he's in bola so it worked out perfectly then you know i have me actually being there at pwg where you know, my first match, the first round match is me wrestling mm. Tedeschi Takeshita. Yeah, yeah. Which was probably one of my favorite matches of 2023. Maybe my favorite match of 2023. Yeah. Um, in my head, I was like, they couldn't have gone any better. The way I was such an unknown to that crowd, mm -hmm. and I and I literally got over in front of them. I was like, this is a victory, and I had no idea what I was doing the day the next day. I, I think I was aware that I'd be in a multi man tag. I was like, okay, I'm not in a tournament anymore. They normally do like non-tournament tag match of all the former people or people who were in the tournament. And I thought there might be a surprise, maybe. Yeah. I didn't expect Chris Jericho, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite wrestlers yeah. ever. Him and The Rock. Those are the two my favorite wrestlers ever. Um, yeah, I find out the day I get to the venue, like, oh yeah, yeah, you're in a tag match with Jericho. And I, I don't know what it was, but we just happened to do so much together yeah. in that 10 men tag match. He took a liking to me, you know. He told me to keep in touch, and then next thing you know, I'm I'm, I'm on talk as Jericho. Next thing you know, I'm I'm being invited onto yeah. Jericho cruise, and 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 uh, it's somewhere in it's somewhere in here where I'm the oceanic champion, the Chris Jericho champion. It, it really just happened the way it did, and where I'm like, I'm still to this day like, ha, ha, what? Why? Why me? I, I don't know the answer why me, but here we are. That's brilliant. Like again, like I say, I assume like within the business, people make these choking gestures, like, oh, we'll keep in touch type of thing, but nobody will really follow up on it. That's really cool of him. Like he's gone out of his way then to get you on a show, then put bring you onto his cruise, not just put you featuring in matches then. You also you're beating the likes of Mike Bailey, Johnny TV from WWE. Then you're beating Matt Cardona to become the Oceanic champion. Like that is 
it was a shame they weren't fully like recorded and put out, out onto AEW TV as they have done in previous Jericho cruises because that would have been really cool content to have, be it on YouTube or whatnot or some sort of streaming platform. But just reading about it from afar and knowing it was going on at the time, we're like, shit, that is unbelievable. What was that experience like in itself? Like, I mean, almost sort of castaways it's just a scenario where you're just surrounded by people who are obsessed with wrestling and rock and roll, seemingly. It was so cool. It was yeah. so, it was such an amazing experience. Okay. Um, I was, there was the worry, you know, when, you know, the wrestlers are being outnumbered by the, by the fans and you're just stuck on a boat. <laughs> Oh, is it going to be like weird or awkward or yeah, comfortable yeah. or like is your is your are you going to look for some privacy at times and it's yeah. going to be invaded but genuinely everybody was so respectful and everybody on the cruise we're all like so there's like buffets all around the cruise and everybody's eating from the same buffet wrestlers and fans there's jacuzzis hot tubs swimming pools the wrestlers are swimming in the same place that the fans are sunbathing in the same place the fans are we're all sharing the same amenities in mm -hmm. the cruise and everybody's getting along because we just remembered oh yeah we're all human beings yeah, and yeah. and the common thing is that we all like wrestling so at most we'll just kind of bond over wrestling and then the only difference is they'll see me wrestle later on the cruise that night or that day but i i, I really really enjoyed my time there and and as well being someone from here from the uk it was the best part was having a warm January. That was staying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to go back next year again. I, have to, I guess I have to defend my Jericho Cruise title. So it's, I'll be a warm January or even a warm July because it's pissing rain here in Dublin. The minute I I, I settle for that. Uh, listen, pro, the event opportunities you've had up the back this past year, like even recently when you're going to CMLL, you're performing at Arena Mexico, you're performing at Arena Coliseo. You're facing the likes of Volador. You're facing that, your team with the likes of Bad Dutito, Che Cabrera. You're losing to, you're facing the likes of Ultimo Guerrero. What was that whole experience like? Because it wasn't just like a one-off appearance. You're there for five nights in a row. And then on top of that, then you get invited to the British Embassy. Like that was a really cool moment to make somebody within the Mexican market. It looked unbelievable. What was that like as a whole? Uh, I, I was treated, myself and Amira, we were treated like amazingly by CMLL. I can't say enough good things about the company. I mean, it, it's it's a major wrestling company, and that's my first time wrestling for a major wrestling company. And and you, but it really felt like they went out of their way to mm. present us in a in such a a high a, a like kind of kind of like a high order yeah. um, to have so much respect for Rev Pro by having the title match be the main event of one of their Arena Mexico shows. Yeah. was really cool and you know to be a part of the talk shows there were like there was like different like fan tours that were happening yeah, yeah. and they wanted me to be like front and center of them uh it, it was such a cool thing and, and i've never wrestled in front of that many people in my life so that's a cool goal to tick off like i think the fantastic mania show yeah, yeah. was 16 and a half thousand people yeah. sold out in arena mexico but then the, the smallest show was in arena coliseo yeah. or there was arena puebla and we're talking about five or six thousand and, and those are the, you know yeah. what I mean? Those are yeah, the yeah. smaller shows, which, you know, over here, we'd be happy. We'd be like a good draw is 200. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it was so amazing to wrestle in front of that many people. But weirdly enough, the nerves didn't really get to me. Yeah. I felt weirdly comfortable. I was like, oh, my gosh, I actually feel I can do this. I feel like I, I can wrestle in front of that many people in, in an arena. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my style did translate as well to wrestling in front of an arena, which is something that I might have been worried about if, like, my independent wrestling comfort would just be I'm, I'm good with intimate venues. But I think I, I think I did a really good job in terms of representing uh, wrestling in the UK, wrestling in Europe. And hopefully, hopefully I'll be back. No, absolutely smashed it, mate. Like, not even that, you did fantastic at Mania, but you also did Misko's tw 20th anniversary show. Like, just, I, I don't know if that was a fortuitous timing, but, like, for those who aren't aware, obviously people may know him as Sin Cara in this part of the world from his previous WWE run. Misko, over the past 20 years, has been one of the biggest stars in wrestling, period. Like, he's the biggest draw possible within Mexico. And he, I know he's changed his name a number of different times. Like, anytime he's going back to CMLL, he's drawn ridiculous gates, like you talked about, 16,000 there. Just in terms of, like, a feather in your cap, what was it like to perform in that show? Yes, yeah, so that 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 was again. So there was the show in Arena Puebla, which I think was the official twenty anniversary show. But the whole, nearly all the shows I did, yeah. there was kind of like a little, a mystical twenty anniversary little sticker beside everything. Um, 
but the Puebla show was great because he wrestled Averno, which has been one of his longest rivals. Mm. So it was just a very cool thing for them to like revisit a classic match that they had and for everybody to come out and see it. And yeah, you talk about him being a, a big draw. You could you could see the amount of people that were there to see Mystico. You could hear all these people are here to see Mystico Island. So that was, uh, uh, yeah, it's a hundred percent fortuitous to be to be amongst that. And and it made me a want to wrestle him. It probably made Chris Jericho want to wrestle him because he is yeah. <laughs> at the uh, I think the ninety one <laughs> yeah. anniversary show. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was it was such a special thing. There is there was he's a cultural icon there, right. and then I don't mince my words when I say yeah. that the footballers. You know, we're wearing his mask when they celebrate. They just whip out a mask from their shorts and put it on to celebrate. He is, really is the definition of mainstream, like nothing that I don't think we've seen in Western wrestling for, for ages. Yeah, so it's, it's different gravy down there. But like, like, you've had an incredible run. And like, obviously this summer now, you've got a huge number of huge matches coming up between the 12th anniversary. At the end of this month, you're facing Donovan Dijak. I met, I spoke to Donovan Jack last week. He was talking generally just about, oh, I've got all these amazing opportunities coming up and traveling to the UK traveling to Germany, possibly overlooking you somewhat, just in terms of he's excited for travel, ex- coming off his WWE run, thinking, listen, I'm going to turn up, get a paycheck, do what I want. What What are your thoughts for Donovan Jack at the end of this month? It's interesting because part of me feels like he should know who I am. But at the same time, I understand that when you enter the WWE system, it's like full... All full focus into that and you know again in WWE there's so many different brands so many different goals that you need to attain so it can be very easy for him to just think ah you know I, I I'll be back on the indies yeah. uh whoever whatever book can I take is whatever book can I take however I from what I can tell a lot of places that he's agreed to work with are ones that have used them in the past I I, I feel like he did purposely choose RevPro because he had a good relationship with him with them before he left. And, and I spoke about in a promo I did at the 229 how he was on the card of my very first professional wrestling match. Nice. Like he nice. was the number one like name. Like, hey, Donovan Dijak will be here wrestling. And so he I don't expect him to remember that. And that's absolutely fine. But it's such a full circle moment for me uh-huh. that he, he that was probably his last UK tour. He then went on to have his WWE career and now returning to this country, to the UK, doing a tour again. The top guy here is me and then he, I'm who he'll be wrestling. Um, so he might not know a lot about me. He not, might not be prepared for me, but I'm definitely going to be very prepared to wrestle him. And and I'm sure we're going to have a really, really cool match. I'm, I'm sure that we're going to have a match that people will be talking about for a while. And I think we're trying to make that Coventry venue special. So we're going to make sure that that match is enough of a reason that people are like, why did I not come to Coventry? Listen, if he pretends he doesn't know you now, as he certainly will when he arrives in Coventry. Like, listen, you've just defeated an Olympic bronze medalist as well. So listen, there's no reason why he couldn't possibly know exactly who you are and what your achievements have been over the last year. Like, at the end of this last summer, you appeared very, very briefly at All In, like, as, as did a number of AW talents as part of a kind of skirmish and whatnot. Is there any chance we'll see you at AEW All In this year? Like, obviously, the same weekend as the 12th anniversary, you expect huge plans for that. Is there any chance you might pop up in a, a better or similar position? So th- th- that's what I want to do. I, I I would love to try my best to be in a, a better position if I do turn up. Yeah. Uh, uh, just so I can measure. So just to, it's, so it's a way that I can measure that I'm going in the upper traje- trajectory. When I was on, I was on. Uh, Mark Andrews had had a podcast with Sean Thorne, and they were like, "Oh, what's your prediction for in the next year?" And that, my my prediction was to wrestle in front of more than ten thousand people because that's how I'd measure that. I'm going an upper trajectory. So the same thing for all in. Like, I wouldn't want to just be security again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because then it feel like I haven't really gone gone anywhere, at least in the eyes of mm. those who are in charge of AEW. So my my goal, I think I've already done enough. Oh, yeah. But my goal is to make sure that like it wouldn't make sense if Michael Oku yeah. was a security guard. And you know, we talk about again Chris Jericho. When I was on his podcast, they had announced that AEW had announced that they were going to do a show mm. in the UK. I think it was London that they said. Nobody knew what the venue was going to be. Mm. So most people were probably assuming that oh, they'd come down to do a dynamite and collision taping. 
And then he said, oh, guaranteed you'll be on the show. You'll you'll wrestle, guaranteed, because he assumed it'll be that. Yeah. Well, they are coming down and they are doing Dynamite Collision Chapin in Wales. Uh, so nothing is confirmed, yeah. but I, I feel like if UK wrestlers are going to be on that show wrestling, oh, yeah. I feel like I should be one of them. I think there's a level of expectation uh, amongst fans, particularly those who follow Red Pro, those who are part of the kind of AEW zeitgeist who understand New Japan, CMLL, AEW, Rev Pro, that kind of internal relationship and dynamics. There is an expectation, but there's, there's also anticipation for you appearing, be it before All In. Like last year, you saw the likes of Grado. That was a nice tip of the cap to the previous success at ICW. But now AEW is very much pivot over the last 12 months. And I would be personally a bit disappointed if you weren't featured in some sort of skirmish or match or whatnot. But I'm very, very excited on that front. 12th anniversary is coming up that same weekend though for Rev Pro. Like, what can fans expect from your end? Do you have anything you'd like to tell us or give us a hint on or whatnot? What's one of the plans for your end for 12th anniversary thus far? I mean, you know, I, I like calling, I'm calling it Couple Box Weekend because that's my priority that weekend. And I feel like last year, I feel like 99% of people that went to the Rev Pro show enjoyed themselves. A lot of them were probably watching Rev Pro for the first time, of course. You know, we are taking people who are coming to see AEW and say, hey, sample our products. And I think people left with a good impression. What I want, the main thing I want more than anything, other than having a great match with Luke Jacobs, is I want us to match the attendance number that we that we did last year or top it. Uh, North Wrestling just had a uh, Thunderstruck. And, you know, the first time they did, they ran that venue, the Walker Dome in Newcastle. I think they got just over 700 people. And not that it's, that's, of course, impressive. And not that it's not impressive, but, like, the first time you do a big show, you, you can get a big number because it's the yeah. first time. So the novelty of it being first, mm -hmm. it's easier to get it. But doing it the second time, you you should always kind of expect to be less th lesser yeah. than or have a low number. But they outdrew they did a bigger show. They got more than 800 people, which is in actually incredible. I, I That's made me have more belief that we can also now get 4,000 or more. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. In terms of what the Copper Box, the show, you know, we're, we're just going to try and put all guns blazing in terms of trying to get the best wrestlers we can for the show, but also the best Rev Pro wrestlers. Yeah. Um, I think what's coolest for me and what's going to be an absolute honor for me is that me and Luke Jacobs will be the main event of the show. We will be the last match. It's going to be between two British independent wrestlers. I think that's a bold move by Andy, but I feel like it's the, it's the one that that makes the most sense because this is a Rev Pro show. So you put your best foot forward and you show the world that two Rev Pro wrestlers, two British independent wrestlers can be the last match and that's the match that you want to see more than anyone else so yes there'll be Ishii yes there'll be Hedgesera versus Xavier uh -huh. Jr and many more other matches but like I I'm I'm hoping that myself versus Luke Jacobs for the Undisputed British Heavyweight title steals the weekend oh, yeah. not just the show uh, listen, I've no doubt there's a very very good chance it definitely will 100% will be I'll be at all three of those shows. I'll be at the Diamond Light Collision Tape in Cardiff. I'll be at the Red Pro Show on the weekend. I'll be at All In. I'm hugely, hugely excited for all of that, my friend. Listen, there's just so many exciting things in the horizon. Is there any other projects you want to let our fans know, be it this side of the world over in, or over in the American fan base as well? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, really, that is the, that is the big show I'm coming, I'm, I'm talking about. I get, oh, well, I mean, I feel like everything's fresh for but but honestly, we also added a York Hall date. Um, which some people may say is a risk. You know, it's the same month. I think it's two weeks before the copper box. Yeah. Is Andy Quilled and crazy? The answer is yes. Yes. But of course. It's but... it's yes. <laughs> <laughs> For vastly different reasons, but yeah. For many different reasons. <laughs> but I think it's about keeping that momentum going. It's about keeping that momentum going and believing that the the interest in in British wrestling and Rev Pro is so high that you know what? There's no need to keep to 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 think, oh, let's do the smallest shows possible, the smallest venues possible, because we need to fill out this big one. No, it's all big venues. And let me just say, get the tickets to that, because uh, they're announcing the full card okay. the night after the Coventry show, I believe. Wow. Um, and ticket prices are going up the night after the Coventry show. So 
get them while they're affordable and nice and cheap because uh, I think uh, Andy has some aces up his sleeve and he, I don't think he'd be running your call for no reason. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Listen, as an avid wrestling fan, an avid Red Pro fan, an avid Michael Oku fan, I'm hugely excited for so much more from you over the next coming months and the years ahead. Michael, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it, my friend. No, oh, no problem, Mark. No, I'm glad we got to, to do this. And, and hey, maybe we can do it again in the future. We'll have way more to talk about. One million, million percent. Thank you very much, friend. Have a great evening. No worries. You take care, Mark.